Okay, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Kay Timbo and I serve as a community relations coordinator out of uh, public information. Uh, tonight's program is brought to you by the chairman of the Intergovernment Relations Committee and your District 4 representative, Commissioner Mark Jarrell, in collaboration with the county's public health department, public information department, IT department, Alliance Health, as well as Novant's Health. Uh, the purpose of this uh, tonight's program is to be both informative and engaging. So please feel free to share your comments, your questions via chat. And uh, if you are not speaking, please remain muted out of uh, respect uh, for the speakers. At this time, I know it's 608. Without further ado, I'll yield the screen uh, to the man behind the event, uh, our commissioner, Commissioner Mark Jarrell. Thank you, Kay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Jarrell. I am a uh, county commissioner and uh, been elected by the people of District 4. It is an honor to bring you this update. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. First, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some elected officials that are on the call and say thank you so much for being here. Uh, we do have county commissioner that represents dis uh, District 5, Laura Meyer here. So thank you, Commissioner Meyer. And then we also have our at large school board member, Jennifer Delahara, who is here as well. So thank you for being here and uh, thank you both for your continued work and commitment. Tonight we've got a uh, great panelists lined up. So, so let me just tell you real quick um, what the intent is behind tonight's meeting. I know a lot of us are quote unquote COVID out, um, but you know, COVID is not out. And it is important for us to make sure that we have guidance around how we need to proceed, how we need to interact with one another. And we also need to understand what resources are available. One of my biggest concerns, and I think from a board perspective, I think from a school board perspective as well, I've talked to school board member Delahara about this. I've talked to Commissioner Meyer and other colleagues. We are very concerned about uh, behavioral health, mental health resources as well. A lot of people in our community, we, we, we say um, that resources are available, but we don't know how to access them. Um, and so one of the things that we'll do tonight, we have uh, a great uh, panel lined up. Of course, we have Dr. Raynard Washington, who is the director of Mecklenburg County Public Health here with us. Uh, you all know him and see him from the uh, county update. We also have a great friend of mine, Dr. Jerome Williams, who every time I call, thank you, Dr. Williams, for every time I call on you, uh, you are out in the community, out in the street to help us engage and to educate. Uh, and you all know him as the Senior Vice President of um, uh, Consumer Engagement for Novant Health, one of our partners at the county. And uh, a new friend tonight, Dr. Moncad, who is uh, Chief Medical Officer with Alliance Health, and uh, we will be able to, to really provide this uh, route and course with respect to our behavioral health access and resources as well. All three uh, panelists will have presentations uh, that they'll go through, and I, I encourage everyone to please put your questions in the chat. We wanna get to as many questions as humanly possible uh, again, please stay on mute. This will be recorded. We'll distribute it through our other networks, social media networks. And I believe that we will come out with some great information. So with that said, I am gonna turn it over to our first panelist and that's Dr. Raynard Washington, Director of Mecklenburg County Public Health. Thank you and welcome. Wonderful, thanks Commissioner Durell and, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to provide uh, an update in this setting uh, for everyone here and for those who may be looking at this, uh, the recording of this, of where things stand with COVID-19 in the county. I do have some slides, but I will kind of move through those pretty quickly. Uh, I really uh, love to take the opportunity to answer folks' questions. I know with COVID, there is so much information, so much misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and so certainly any opportunity where we can uh, respond to people's questions uh, in an environment that's safe uh, and, and really sort of get to the, the heart of the matter is, is, is a great use of time. Uh, 
Uh, as I imagine, everybody knows, you can get to the next slide, uh, we are currently experiencing uh, a pretty uh, incredible surge of COVID-19 here in Mecklenburg County, across the state, across the country, uh, related to the Omicron variant of the virus. Uh, that uh, variant happens to be uh, two to three times more transmissible uh, than the Delta variant, which was, you know, five to ten times more transmissible than the Alpha variant. Uh, and so we, the, the virus is getting more and more easier to spread uh, from person to person, which is certainly concerning uh, and has translated to an unprecedented number of cases in our community. Uh, it's uh, unlikely that anybody that's watching this or I've talked to has not been in contact with somebody or, or doesn't know someone personally that has COVID. As I said uh, previously, it's getting much closer to everybody's home. And so. Uh, we have a lot of cases, um, uh, lots of uh, challenges relative to individuals trying to access COVID resources, whether that be testing or, or um, treatments uh, or hospital care or services. Uh, and so we are, uh, we are making our way through the surge, uh, but it certainly has been a challenging several weeks. We've been going through this for about the last five and a half, six weeks. Um, and we are watching closely uh, and anticipating at some point uh, our upward trajectory will start to go downward. Um, I won't go into great detail about all the numbers here, but suffice it to say all of our, um, our metrics are higher than they've ever been at any point in this pandemic. Uh, and we are uh, experiencing higher case counts every day, lots of hospitalizations are uh, the majority, a large number of uh, individuals uh, tests that are testing for COVID are coming back positive, uh, at least one in three right now. Uh, and we have a, just a huge amount of demand for testing in the community, which we're working to expand. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, you can move forward uh, to the next slide. Uh, again, our case rates are higher than they've ever been. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, our percent positivity is starting to show a little bit of uh, indication that we may be hitting a plateau in the near future. Uh, again, we are watching this closely. There's a quite a bit of variability with the winter storm Izzy uh, in the last couple of days. A number of our metrics have been a little off uh, from what we might expect, given that there were, was no testing for at least a couple of days over the weekend. Uh, and so we'll, we're, we're looking forward to uh, seeing what happens in the next you know, five to seven days. Uh, as we are anticipating uh, a, a plateau to occur in the next couple of weeks for sure. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of vaccinations, which is really uh, at the heart of everything we talk about relative to COVID or, or needs to be at the center of our conversation, uh, we, have, we have safe and effective vaccines that are free and they work. Um, at this time, we continue to see uh, in the hospital, for example, we have well over 600 people hospitalized here in Mecklenburg County with COVID-19, uh, and uh, more than 90% of those individuals, uh, particularly those who are in the most severe shape, those who are in intensive care unit or on ventilators, unfortunately are people who haven't yet to be fully vaccinated or are not up there on their vaccine or, or have not gotten their booster dose, for example. Uh, and so that that continues to be one of the most important things that we all need to and can do to be able to help us move uh, beyond the uh, impact of this virus is having on our community and everyday life. Uh, it is important for us, uh, again, if you think about 600 plus people in the hospital, 90% of those folks not being up to date on their vaccine, you know, you know, that's potentially, you know, essentially, you know, <laughs> another 550 people that may not be in the hospital if, in fact, uh, vaccines were, uh, had gotten, had, they had been up to date on their vaccines. And so certainly for us, that is important uh, and is a message that we continue to spread throughout the community every day on the ground uh, in forums like this uh, to really, again, answer people's questions, people who are hesitant. I understand people's hesitancy and fear. Uh, we have to listen to those questions and we have to answer those questions, uh, but certainly we do have to start to move more people in our community, particularly our communities of color uh, who continue to lag behind uh, in vaccine uptake. And unfortunately, the, the, the result of that is there are more people of color in the hospital, more people of color dying from COVID, uh, which further exacerbates those disparities that we know already exist in uh, both COVID outcomes, but in overall life expectancy and other outcomes. Uh, you can move forward. Uh, keep going. All right, uh, and I just sort of spoke to this, but I think the numbers are really alarming if you see them, you know, if, if in fact, you know, and this is part of our message to folks about vaccines, um, you know, if you're, it's, 
individuals who are not up to date or unvaccinated adults uh, are 10 to 17 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID than those who have been vaccinated. I mean, that's a huge risk. Uh, and I think understanding that risk really is a message that we're trying to make sure we get out to the community and we have other people helping us share that message uh, that it really is not a risk that we should be taking. The risk is so huge and the consequence, the potential consequence of losing life or having long-term, long COVID, long-term uh, sort of complications of the virus really in fact are um, challenging, are not worth it. And, and, and vaccination is certainly a better pathway. Uh, and really, again, is, is the most one of the most important tools we have in our toolbox to be able to respond to the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, just a couple of quick updates. And again, I don't want to take up too much of the space here tonight. And I do want to have time to answer people's questions. But uh, we are we know that there's a lot of strain with testing right now. And that's been a big area of concern. And Commissioner Durrell talked about resources uh, that people are looking for, seeking out a need. And so COVID testing is certainly something that we've been working to expand access to. Uh, we have a number of new sites that have been set up in the county, uh, at one at Carowinds, one at the racetrack in Concord. We have another one opening uh, pretty soon at the Park Expo uh, and also uh, making available uh, at our regular sites that we have in the county as well, trying to extend those hours as much as possible to be able to uh, address some of the demand as we're hopefully in the last several weeks of the Omicron surge here in Mecklenburg. Uh, also, the uh, federal government uh, has launched covidtest.gov where individual households can go on and request for rapid test kits to be mailed to your house in about a week or a week and a half. Uh, and so certainly encourage people to take advantage of that resource. Uh, it is certainly a great complement to the efforts we have going on here in the ground in Mecklenburg County. Uh, and we are expecting additional shipments of rapid test in Mecklenburg that we hope to be able to distribute in the community uh, on uh, at mass distribution sites, as well as at our library distribution program uh, as soon as our shipment comes in. Uh, one more update around sort of case investigation and contact tracing, and then I'll, I'll pause and sort of let others uh, uh, provide their updates. Um, you know, we are, and, you know, as, as COVID, you know, I usually start with this, but I guess I'll end with it today. COVID's here, uh, and it's not going anywhere, uh, anytime soon. And so we, as a community have got to learn, um, how to live with it and how to protect ourselves. And I've talked a lot about vaccines, which of course are 1 of the most important tools we have. We also have mask, uh, mask is, they're very helpful tools. With reducing the risk of transmission, obviously, right now, with the transmissibility of the uh, Omicron variant, we are encouraging people to use medical grade masks to offer themselves more protection if they can tolerate them, if they're comfortable for them. Uh, if, you, if they're not comfortable, we advise at least a disposable surgical mask with a cloth mask on top of it. Uh, and again, something that's close fitting to your face. Uh, and of course, those additional layers of protection help reduce the risk that you'll uh, be exposed or are exposing others if you are infected. Uh, so those two tools are really important, but also, you know, as we um, are moving into more of a, a long-term uh, response to COVID and, and adapting and adjusting to COVID being here, there are a couple of other things that everybody can do, I think, to help us in the response. And the first of those is really simple and it probably, uh, most people don't think about it, but if you're sick, stay at home. Uh, and that's a, 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 a a reality that we really haven't faced as a community. Uh, people are so accustomed if they have a cold or the flu, they still go out of the house and they're spreading it all around and don't think twice about it, they'll come to work. Uh, but really, I, I think we've, if we've learned nothing else from you know the uh, impact that this respiratory virus is having on our community, is that if we are sick or we're having cold-like symptoms or we have some, some kind of infection or evidence of an infection, the best course of action is to stay away from other people and not transmit or share those germs with others. Um, and so if people are sick, if, the best thing you can do is just stay home. And if you are sick, and you've been around other people uh, while you've been sick or experiencing symptoms, it's good to tell those folks that you've been around them. Like, I, I've, I'm, something's going on, I'm feeling sick, you might want to watch out whether it's COVID or the flu or anything else. Uh, so those individuals can have that information to help make their decisions. We have been up until this point uh, spending a lot of manpower to uh, call folks and help 
them do that contact tracing process where they tell people that they've been around that they're sick. But it's uh, as we again adapt and adjust to COVID being a part of our society, it's important for folks to sort of take on that responsibility of just talking to folks that you've been around if you have been sick and been around them, or if you start to develop symptoms and you know you were having dinner with someone the day before, it's always a good idea to just to say, hey, I'm starting to feel sick. You might want to watch out for symptoms. Uh, as we normalize that, uh, it really will be a helpful uh, part of our response to, to COVID, but also to other respiratory infections that we can spread that we might spread. Um, and then the last the last tip that I'll say, uh, wear a mask, uh, get vaccinated, don't go around people if you're sick. Um, and certainly if you've been around other people, uh, just continue to practice good uh, good hygiene. Uh, so washing your hands and uh, ensuring that we, we do things to promote good health in general uh, will help to keep us all safe and, and protect each other. So I'll stop there and, and let the other speakers jump in and fill in the holes that I missed. Thank you for that update, Dr. Washington. Um, and what I've done is I went ahead and placed a link uh, to your resource that uh, folks can go to get uh, the latest updates on. Uh, uh, at this time, I'd like to yield the screen to Dr. Jerome Williams, uh, who will be on behalf of the Bond Health. So, James. Thank you, Kay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Jarrell, for once again. Uh, being a leader in this community and staying engaged. Uh, the importance of staying engaged with our communities is that it builds trust. And trust is fundamental for combating this misinformation and, and disinformation that, that's out there. So I uh, just want to say thank you uh, for your continued engagement. Also want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Washington. Um, and his partnership with the, the county, you know, this 3 year, um, actually we're going to year 3 of this pandemic, uh, has not been, um, isolated to 1 healthcare system or another. We've uh, come together to fight this collaboratively. Uh, we've come together as partners. We've come to share resources and to, uh, leverage, um, uh, each other's, um, uh, uh, talents, uh, to, to serve our community. So. I just want uh, everyone to understand that we're all in this boat together and that we've been swimming um, in the same direction uh, with the same cadence. Next slide, please. So just a very quick uh, um, update over the past year. Uh, Dr. Washington mentioned uh, disparities and equities as it relates to uh, um, uh, the vaccine and, and COVID response. Um, over the past uh, year, it has been an intentional effort uh, to have a response uh, to address inequities uh, as it relates to COVID in our communities. This is even before vaccines were um, uh, released last December because we have a, uh, a documented history of inequities across certain communities. And so we had to strategically and intentionally uh, plan for that. And, and we did that with what we call our uh, pop-up clinics or our um, community events. And with those community events, we partnered with trusted uh, community uh, leaders and partners to engage in those historically excluded communities to get them um, uh, registered, to get them out uh, for uh, vaccinations. And if you look at the graphic below, uh, when we look at the data from our community events, uh, we are two to three times uh, more uh, likely to engage with this historically excluded communities with those targeted events. So it's very important that you, we have an intentional focus on historically excluded communities and those communities where there is um, um, lack of uptake of, of, of uh, vaccinations. Next slide, please. So this slide um, really sums up um, the whole hour and a half that we're going to spend today, which is uh, those individuals that are unvaccinated or are partially vaccinated are the ones that are highest risk for hospitalization. Those are the ones that are highest risk for uh, admission to the ICU and being put on life support. And so it's crucial that we uh, continue to communicate, provide resources and access to those members of our communities uh, that are unvaccinated. Now, um, while we understand there are many reasons uh, for those uh, individuals who are, are um, somewhat hesitant about um, uh, obtaining the vaccine, uh, I will say that uh, the strain that Dr. Washington mentioned earlier on the healthcare systems 
has a rippling effect across other disease states in our community. So, for example, there are individuals who may not be seeking care in uh, the emergency room for heart attacks and strokes and things of that nature uh, because of uh, one fear of going to emergency rooms and then two. Uh, in certain areas, sure, surely not in Mecklenburg County, but across the country where uh, individuals don't even have access to uh, clinical care because hospitals are full. Next slide, please. So just uh, really brief, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because uh, I think um, a, a Q and A is where um, we, we should have a lot of engagement. But where are we right now? Once again, Omicron is, is surging across the country. Um, it's surging across the, uh, North Carolina, and we see it uh, in our healthcare system uh, as well. Uh, we uh, once again uh, know that uh, about 94 to 95% of the patients being admitted to our institution are un unvaccinated. Those who are vaccinated, those who are vaccinated and contract COVID, typically are individuals that are very sick, immunocompromised, cancer uh, uh, treatments, and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a small uh, segment of the of the vaccinated pop population. Um, I, I would uh, just suffice it to say on this slide that we're still in the middle of a surge. Um, we're still seeing high numbers and we cannot let our guard down. Next slide, please. So uh, what about treatments and therapies? I'm not going to spend um, um, any significant um, uh, time on this because I really feel when you start talking about treatments and therapies, uh, you discuss that uh, with your uh, healthcare uh, provider uh, in, in person. However, uh, there are some overarching themes that we've seen over the last couple of months. Uh, one of the uh, effective thera uh, therapies, monoclonal antibodies that's used to treat COVID, uh, they're in limited supply right now. Okay, it's in limited supply. Uh, so uh, once again, prevention as opposed to intervention is still uh, the best uh, way for um, um, uh, dealing with this pandemic. We do have newer therapies that are being developed, uh, pills that will reduce the severity of, of illness when one gets uh, COVID. However, it's still early on. Some of these um, um, uh, pharmaceuticals are not even to market. And, and when they do uh, come to market, they will not be um, um, uh, as readily available. So that leads to the uh, bold uh, statement below, which is a full vaccination series with a booster is our best uh, opportunity to avoid any serious complications uh, from uh, COVID. Next slide, please. So what can we expect uh, moving forward? You know, Dr. Washington uh, showed a, uh, a graphic that um, may suggest that in the next uh, week or two, a few weeks, we may see a plateau in the number of cases, which would be great. Right now, those cases are still um, 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 are surging and increasing. Uh, we are hopeful that um, the pandemic will come to um, an end. And when I say an end, that means uh, it really turns into uh, an endemic phase. An endemic phase means that we just uh, uh, know that we are living with COVID, that we're managing uh, uh, COVID, and that we are um, um, uh, addressing it uh, with different therapeutics similar to the flu. And so uh, perhaps in the next, uh, you know, six months, four months, I can't really say, this may be something that we're just going to be living with, just like we live with this uh, with the flu. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going to spend any time on this because we have an expert uh, uh, coming up uh, next to speak on mental health. But I cannot have any conversation about COVID without at least bringing mental health into the room. Every single one of us, every single one of us, um, have. Uh, have experienced significant stress and strain as it relates to to COVID. Our frontline workers uh, who've been to toiling going on three years are experiencing stress and strain. Our students, our children, our students in school are experiencing stress and strain. And so we must acknowledge it. We can't um, um, hide from it. And we have to um, um, identify the resources across our community, whether it be uh, faith leaders, whether it be professional counselors, whether it be professional healthcare care um, uh, personnel to uh, address some of the challenges related to mental health and COVID. Next slide, please. <laughs> so just a little bit about testing information. First and foremost, I want to drive home 
the fact that folks should not go to emergency rooms for testing. That is the most inappropriate place to go for testing. I, I say that over and over again because when you go to the emergency room for testing, it once again provides strain, strain on the resources across healthcare systems. There are many different avenues to pursue uh, getting tested across our communities outside of the emergency room. Um, if you're interested in the COVID-19 uh, test uh, within the Novant system, there's a link right there. And Kay, if you can post that into the chat, that would be uh, greatly, uh, greatly appreciated. In addition, I always encourage individuals to once again seek out trusted information. And I put uh, the CDC uh, guidance uh, for vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals here so that you can uh, research uh, this information from a trusted uh, source. Next slide, please. And then uh, lastly, we continue to have uh, pop up community vaccination events. Once again, these uh, pop up events. Um, or are uh, in, in partnership and collaboration with many of our community partners so that we can target uh, communities that historically uh, may not have access, historically um, may have avoided healthcare systems. And as you can see, the dates here are February uh, 5th and February uh, 12th at the locations um, uh, outlined here. Uh, next slide. And, and lastly, once again, I am pushing for those who are unvaccinated or under vaccinated, meaning those who are eligible to receive a booster and they have not received the booster, please get vaccinated uh, for yourselves, for your families and for our community. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Williams. And I uh, believe I uh, placed the link in the chat. If it's not appearing, please let me know. And uh, at this time, uh, last but not least, uh, will yield the screen to Dr. Uh, Moncad with uh, Alliance Health. Uh, so Dr. Moncad. Yeah, thank you, Kay. I very much appreciate being here and I'm honored uh, to be asked uh, to join the commissioner and the distinguished guests. Uh, thank you again for highlighting uh, the mental health part of what we're all going through. Um, you can't have a healthy body uh, without a healthy mind. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. What I wanted to do first uh, is introduce Alliance. Uh, we are excited uh, to be a new partner uh, with Mecklenburg County and to serve the individuals uh, who are fortunate to call Mecklenburg their home. Uh, so Alliance is uh, what the state calls an LMEMCO. Uh, we are the organization that provides uh, mental health benefits for people uh, who uh, receive their health care through Medicaid um, and for uninsured individuals. Uh, those, those benefits uh, range uh, in, in quite a wide uh, array. Uh, they include uh, outpatient care. You go out to see a mental health provider, uh, inpatient, um, and then some special services uh, for uh, individuals who need them. Uh, the population that we're mostly focused on are folks with uh, more severe conditions and those with uh, intellectual disability. And like I said, we've been uh, in Mecklenburg County for uh, just a few weeks, uh, and I'm looking forward to a, a really long and, and fruitful relationship. Next slide, please. You all know this. You don't need a psychiatrist to tell you that uh, we have all been suffering. We all suffer in our own way. Uh, so there's no way to, to know by just looking at someone from the outside uh, what's going on on the inside. Uh, but one of the things that I can tell you uh, is that a population that uh, we have noticed uh, that, that deserves as much attention as we can give them are our children. Um, and we're seeing more children in the emergency room and in other emergency settings uh, than we have uh, before. Um, and that is a tragedy on a variety of counts. One of the reasons that we don't like seeing uh, anybody uh, in the emergency room unless they have to be, uh, and 
uh, I believe Dr. Williams mentioned this, is that if you are in the emergency room for something that is not COVID related specifically, uh, because you, you are sick with COVID itself, then you are now exposed to people who have COVID. Um, and so the chance of you contracting the virus, if you haven't had it already, goes up. Um, another population that we are very concerned about um, are uh, people that use substances. And uh, what we've seen, you've seen it in the news, uh, is that the rates of death from overdose in the United States and in North Carolina are higher than they have ever been. In just one year, they jumped 30%, um, which is another tragedy. Uh, one of the pieces that has been a challenge uh, for individuals is figuring out how to use the healthcare system uh, when they are housebound uh, or are sick with COVID and are being told to isolate or quarantine. Uh, and so, uh, you know, learning how to use your phone uh, to, to access a mental health clinician or any other kind of clinician uh, is a challenge. And not everyone is able to, to do it as smoothly. Um, and then the last bit just wanted to mention in terms of challenges um, that need to be overcome uh, is that, uh, you would think that with the burden and the crisis that's going on, that mental health clinicians' offices would be busting at the seams. And that is the case in some instances, and that is not the case in others. Um, and so, believe it or not, there are actually some providers whose offices are not as full as they were before COVID, um, and they are struggling. And the reason we need to keep them alive is that, um, when things go back down uh, to our new normal, uh, we're going to need those resources. We cannot have them close their doors. Next slide. I wanted to talk about some of the things that Alliance is doing. Um, the chief among them, you might have seen on all of my slides in the bottom right, uh, I put the 24 hour access and infor information line. So we have uh, folks, uh, clinicians, and others uh, on call uh, 24 hours a day to answer your questions about how to access services. Um, and for those of you who are just listening um, and not able to see, um, I'll just share the number. And I know it's just been put in the chat. I appreciate that. It's 1-800-510-9132. Uh, um, so, one of the things we did, we're, we're so happy to, to be there, is to, to have an office in Charlotte so we can see what's happening in real time and be responsive um, to the needs of Mecklenburg County. Um, another is that uh, we are expanding our uh, child crisis services and are looking to bring on uh, more resources, resources uh, in that regard. We, we've already added some and we're looking um, to, to continue to expand that. Um, I was mentioning access to telehealth. Um, we've, we've worked with our providers to increase uh, access for some of the folks that we serve to receive cell phones uh, so that they can communicate with us either by audio only uh, or through audio video um, with, with uh, Alliance and with the providers that, uh, that serve them. Um, I, I was talking earlier about making sure our providers are uh, able to stay in business, uh, and that's something that we focus on on a daily basis. Um, one of the pieces that uh, I think all of us have had some version or form of is trying to access either the doctor or some other service that we never would have imagined uh, doing over the phone or through Skype. Uh, through uh, one of those technologies um, and, and working hand in hand uh, with the community of people uh, serving Mecklenburg County is, is something uh, very important for us. Um, and then another piece that I just uh, want to end with on, on this slide um, is the idea that uh, there should be low barriers to getting the care that people need, particularly during COVID. We need to make sure that the right thing to do by people is the easiest thing to do. Um, and that, that is gonna be best uh, for the citizens of Mecklenburg County. 
Um, I don't have a slide on this, but um, I do want to say I, I just can't resist um, as, as one of the doctors um, on the call uh, to, to dispense a little bit of advice um, that, uh, you know, as you are trying to make your way through these uncharted waters, uh, there's a few things you can do to just do your best and potentially even thrive. Uh, and they all have to do with kind of paying attention uh, to what's going on uh, with yourself. And like I said, everyone's journey is unique and different um, and should be honored and, and respected. So one of those things is pay attention to your lifestyle. Um, the things that you put in your mouth um, can either pay dividends in the long run or they can take you down. Um, and so uh, diet uh, is critical. Uh, some people have more time than they ever have uh, and so there are less excuses to not exercise uh, than there have been before uh, for a lot of folks. Uh, and so bringing that back into your routine um, is something that uh, certainly can help your body, but uh, we, we know uh, from decades of evidence uh, that it can have immediate and long-lasting impacts on your mind. Another one I wanted to highlight, particularly since we're talking in January, is sunshine. Um, Sunshine is a scarce commodity uh, in January. And so you want to try to get access to uh, bright light um, during the daytime uh, if possible, and actually not expose yourself to bright light at night. Um, and that's going to help you uh, with your sleep. The last couple of things I'll mention, one is to connect, connect, connect. Um, think about someone you know who lives in isolation or an elderly person who is, has been advised to not congregate uh, due to their health. Um, connect with them, maybe it'll be electronically, uh, but the impact you'll have on both yourself and on that person um, is, is gonna be um, really rewarding um, and satisfying uh, and have, uh, have far-reaching positive benefits. Uh, and the last one, I'll bring this back to our access and information line, is that when the things you're doing um, and those things that people are doing around you are not enough, uh, there is no shame in reaching out. Uh, and so whether that is to your congregation uh, or to a trusted friend uh, or for professional help, uh, that is something that uh, is an imperative. Thank you all very much. I want to thank our panelists for just setting the stage tonight for this important discussion. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about uh, COVID-19, particularly this Omicron variant, and um, the resources that are available, not only for our physical health, but mental health uh, in particular. So um, we have Dr. Moncott, who's with Alliance Health. We have Dr. Jerome Williams with Novant Health and Dr. Raynard Washington, uh, Director of Mecklenburg County Public Health uh, here to answer questions. What we're going to do at this time, uh, we certainly want to open it up and, and hear from the community. We are going to unmute you. What I'm going to ask, Kay and I are going to tag team uh, the Q&A session that we're moving into at this point. And everyone on your screens, you should have an emoji that allows you to raise hand so that we can identify you. Um, and we will call on you. So if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand, uh, use the emoji to raise your hand. And um, for our panelists, um, we're not gonna ask all of you all to answer every single question. Uh, if something is in your wheelhouse, it would be great if um, you would just take that, that question. And, uh, but if you have something pressing or burning that you want to add to it, that would be fantastic. So, Kay, I don't know if you see any uh, raised hands yet um, within the community. I see uh, Janelle Coswell. And so we'll ask Janelle to unmute herself. And, um, and if you want to uh, specifically address one of the panelists, that would be great as well. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. I'm sorry, I couldn't find the button that has <laughs> the raised hand feature, so I just did it manually. Um, first off, I want to just thank all of the panelists and thank everyone for um, all of their work and efforts throughout the, the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, Mark, you have held mul a multiple of these forums from the very beginning and always seeking ways to improve the response and improve the conditions for the community. Uh, today, I'm excited that I'm not just Chanel, I am with the Young Professionals of International House and we have a number of our members here, Eleanor Harris, Hadley Parker, um, Nikita Mittal, and um, uh, Alicia Emmons is here. And we are just, um, we represent a very large and very diverse part of the community. We're representing uh, the in international and immigrant communities, and we're here to speak on uh, on their behalf, on, on issues that we've seen and definitely want to bring to your attention that are important to this, um, this community. Uh, other members of the group will raise their hands and speak to issues that they have a personal connection with. But you, the, the county has been doing such a great job and has really made special efforts to reach out to the refugee and immigrant community to make sure that they have resources with um, you know, language access and healthcare access and things like that. And I just want to um, uh, remind uh, everyone that this community still needs um, you know, a lot of attention because of the vulnerabilities that are created with the socioeconomic uh, standing and of course, language barriers. So maybe it's a, an observation, but also a question. Um, I'll, you know, pose this question to Dr. Washington uh, with the with the um, the surge in Omicron cases. Is there anything um, specific that is being done to uh, extend help and resources to the refugee and immigrant communities that have English language barriers? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Janelle. Thanks for the question. Absolutely. So, first off, I'll say, you know, one, obviously. Our communications are important uh, and making sure that the information that we make available in English is also available in multiple languages. And that's something that we've been committed to. And I have to you know, thank the, the city's office of refugees, uh, as well as all of our community partners who help us make sure that our translations are appropriate and that the interpretation, the translations are, are, are interpreted properly uh, as we make you know, flyers, handouts, educational materials available to the public, and even, you know, a number of things that are available on our website. Uh, secondly, you know, just the last two weeks, we've been working with our, um, a number of our partners who partner with us. Uh, uh, many people may not know, but the health department's responsible for refugee health. Uh, and so, as you well know, we have a number of refugees that have been coming into our community for the last several months. Uh, and so we've been working closely to obviously get those folks uh, in the community, get through their health screenings or immunizations uh, as a part of that process, also providing education and uh, resources around COVID activities, testing, uh, as well as mask. Uh, and in the last two weeks, we've received uh, a large supply of medical grade masks, uh, which we have been working with and some targeted, again, refugee health organizations to be able to distribute those in the community. Uh, I know I talked to our team earlier today specifically about this issue that we had a, a list of about six organizations that they were providing uh, medical grade masks to for distribution uh, among the various constituents. And so uh, we continue to stay in touch and, and obviously uh, we have to listen to the community. I mean, the, the community tells us what's needed uh, and, and our job is sort of be responsible when, when we get those requests. Thank you for that uh, response, Dr. Washington and Janelle. Thank you for that question. Um, does anybody have a question? Commissioner Jarrell, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, feel free to unmute. Uh, I see Alicia Emmons has a question. So Alicia, unmute yourself and uh, ask. And prior to that, I do want to recognize the uh, chairman of the Board of County Commissioners has joined us and that is uh, Chairman uh, Dunlap. So thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. Chairman. Alicia, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Sure, thank you. I, uh, my name is Alicia, and I'm also part of the Young Professionals at the International House. And I also just want to thank you so much for the update tonight. Um, and I appreciate your focus on mental health tonight in our community. And um, the International House actually recently uh, hosted the, a global forum on mental health. 
uh, with local counterparts along with experts and advocates from Namibia and Iraq. And we talked about this topic on a local and a global level. So my question is, how can we as individuals or as organizations in the community assist with the ongoing efforts related to mitigating the effects on mental health that the Omicron variant has had on our community? Dr. Monka, do you want to take that? I'm happy to. Thank uh, you. So first of all, thank you, Alicia, for uh, coming and also for your question. Um, I think the the root of the question is how can one individual or a group of individuals have an impact against what feels like a tidal wave uh, that uh, is crashing against uh, wh what we've you know never experienced? Is is that is that fair, Alicia? Yes, essentially, yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, and so uh, I think you know my my thought is uh, multiple. Uh, one, I'd, I'd go back to that idea of maintaining a sense of community. Um, I have a uh, a couple of children, but one is an undergrad, and he lives in the dorm. Um, and uh, I can tell you that uh, his ability to just uh, form uh, connections with strangers is so impacted uh, by uh, what we are going through uh, that uh, it takes an extra amount of effort. Um, and so uh, my suggestion to begin with that really all of us can do um, is to ask uh, how other people are doing and then most importantly to actually listen uh, non-judgmentally. And that, uh, that second part, believe it or not, is harder to do than it sounds, is to actually listen and to be present um, when someone is telling you how they're doing. And so if you ask you know, how someone's doing and they say, fine, I think it's just fine for you to say, no, really, how are you really doing? And to maybe sit down, make eye contact, and try to see if they will engage with you. And if they don't, you don't have to force that. Uh, but uh, more often than not, you know, when I've had the, the chance to do that, not in a clinical setting, but just as a layperson, um, you'll hear a lot of interesting things from people. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's that piece. But as a group, uh, one thing that you could do, you know, as a collective uh, is to assist uh, communities that may not be uh, as engaged as as they could, and I, I think uh, one of the pieces I heard was that uh, you're you're working with uh, refugees from Iraq and um, Namibia, um, and so trying to figure out uh, what they need um, and connecting them to the resources that uh, that they're that are available um, is something that um, is would be very worthwhile. Thank, thank you for that. And then uh, I saw in the uh, in the uh, audience, uh, Dr. Delahar, did you have a question? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate all the expressed concern about our immigrant refugee communities. First of all, I just wanted to state that um, this is a question for Dr. Mankad. Um, you mentioned a youth crisis center, and I am just curious: is that the same thing as Monarch? I'm not sure if it is, and if you could clarify that. And then if, if you mentioned a possible second center, is that looking to be built possibly on another side of town or what do you, where do you see that going? Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so Monarch runs uh, what's called a facility based crisis center. We really want to decompress uh, the uh, emergency room um, and try to keep people from going to Novant and Atrium unless they are physically ill or I, I guess in the in for behavioral health, if you know, if they're an imminent risk to harm themselves, they, they can certainly also consider the emergency room. But uh, Monarch, which is a provider of behavioral health services uh, that's very prominent in um, in Mecklenburg County and the surrounding counties, uh, does run a, a short stay unit uh, for children uh, in the region. Uh, the second facility-based crisis center that we're in the process of completing um, is a little bit of a distance 
uh, from Charlotte. But uh, the, the good news is that uh, children from, from the Mecklenburg County area would be eligible uh, if the, the Monarch facility is full. Um, and so that, that center is in a town called Fuquay Verena, uh, which is in the southern part of Wake County. Um, so maybe a little, little bit more than a two hour trek, but it, it would be well worth it if, uh, if the only other option uh, is for a child to, to go to the emergency room. I think the other way to think about crisis, and we think about this every day um, uh, at, at Alliance and, and elsewhere, I'm sure, uh, is to think about it as a continuum. Um, and so there are the acute care services. There are some intermediate care services, something called therapeutic foster care is one example of those, uh, which is a type of service that we're expanding. And we're, we're happy to, to work with Dr. Washington and his team um, on a lot of these uh, acute and intermediate services. But uh, I'm curious what, what Dr. Williams would think about this. The real solution for... Um, crisis is to not get into a crisis. Uh, and so if we can, if we can support Mecklenburg by helping to build non-crisis services so that people can get care before things get to a 10 out of 10, when there may be a four out of a 10, then um, we will just have less demand uh, on the whole crisis system, which is already um, overburdened. Dr. Williams, did you want to piggyback on that? Yes, I, I, I sure do, and, and thank you for that. The only thing I would add is that we have to understand as well that there are many different uh, triggers for crisis, right? Um, and there is a significant, and I don't know the exact number, but there's a significant number of individuals that are experiencing challenges because of really non-clinical factors, but factors related to social determinants of health, right? And so if one is um, um, in need of food, if one is in need of shelter, a roof over their head, okay, that really contributes to um, a lot of the challenges that our, that our communities are experiencing. And so it's not just the clinical medical um, and behavioral, um, when I say behavioral, I'm, I'm speaking from a medical standpoint point of view, but we also have to include the uh, social perspective, the social determinants of health in any of our uh, formulations of solutions. Uh, we have to address those, those uh, social determinants of health as well. Oh, I, if, Commissioner, if you wouldn't mind, could I just respond to that? Because I yeah, just, I need, I need to underline that double. Um, you know, all the work that Dr. Williams and I do um, in the clinic and elsewhere, it ends up having, from what the researchers tell me, 20% of the impact on someone's overall health. When you look at housing security, safe neighborhoods, and, uh, and food access, healthy food access, that is 80%. And I know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I just have to say this uh, out loud that those, those are issues that um, uh, we absolutely believe in. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to go to Kenny Robinson. Kenny, if you'll just unmute. All right, I'm unmuted. I have put my question in the chat box, but I'll just um, read it for uh, Dr. Washington first. If you have contracted and recovered from the Omicron variant, do you have antibodies to prevent catching it again? I ask that question because three members of my immediate household contracted Omicron, but my eight-year-old daughter um, did not, and she was tested at her school four different times within the past two weeks and tested negative each time. So do we assume that she did contract it and was just asymptomatic and now has the antibodies and it's not being detected? Sure, thanks, Kenny. Thanks for the question. Uh, so so the, in short, I guess, globally speaking, certainly after a person's had an infection, um, they are believed to have uh, antibodies 
against the virus uh, that are effective at protecting them from reinfection uh, for at least three months. Uh, some people's immune system is a little bit more, um, uh, retains information about how to fight viruses a little bit longer than others. And so that natural protection may last longer than three months. Uh, but all evidence suggests that at least three months, uh, for at least three months, you should be free of, of reinfection. Um, that is globally true. Uh, of course, there is still more to know about various variants and being able to be reinfected with other variants over time. But that is, in general, we believe reinfection is not possible after, you know, for, for at least 90 days after you've recovered. Uh, in terms of your uh, the situation with your daughter, it's very likely that she may have avoided developing an infection, uh, her own natural immunity, or I'm not sure if she's vaccinated. It could be a whole host of things that protected her from being infected. She also could have had a prior infection that never was picked up, uh, and she had already had it and recovered for, from it before the rest of the family. There are a whole host of probably circumstances that could lead to it, but... Um, uh, if she didn't test positive, then there's no real evidence that she uh, has had an infection, uh, but it's certainly possible that she had one previously. Thank you for that question, Kenny, and thank you for the response, uh, Dr. Washington. Uh, now, now go to Hadley. Uh, appreciate your patience. I know your hand was raised for a while. If you mute yourself and ask your question. Hadley. Hi, yes, thank you, uh, Kay. Um, I am Hadley Parker, and I just want to thank um, Commissioner Jarrell for hosting and for um, all the panelists uh, joining us tonight. I know you guys have a very busy schedule. Um, I have been an educator in Charlotte uh, for the past seven years, and um, as an educator, we are part of the frontline worker force, and we're doing our best to provide and maintain a quality education uh, for all students while also trying to um, combat the stresses of COVID-19. And I think uh, most educators would agree that the top priority is the kids and the students. However, um, there's major concern regarding the health and safety among teachers and uh, school personnel. And so I have uh, two questions. Um, my first question is, what is being done to increase uh, access to testing kits and masks like the KN95s or N95s uh, for educators and um, students? And my second question is, given that we are in the worst part of the pandemic um, so far, what is the threshold uh, to trigger virtual learning in order to minimize spread and keep students and staff safe. Hi, Hadley. I'll, I'll take a first step at that. Uh, so, uh, first off, you know, we are working very closely with our partners at CMS to uh, to do everything possible to make sure that they have as, as many resources available as possible. Uh, there have been a number of activities in the last month, several months to help uh, to prepare CMS uh, for this surge and future surges. I think I, I say this, um, you know, we have the tools at our disposal to be able to help us be able to manage through the surges, which will continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we did recently, just about a week and a half ago, we delivered about 150,000 medical grade masks to CMS. Uh, thanks to our partners at Atrium, uh, we're able to deliver those to make available to both the teaching staff, but also uh, other staff who are in uh, in contact on a daily basis with with students, bus drivers, folks in the cafeteria, greeters, whoever may be uh, in in contact in the in the school setting, that they are were adult masks, and so really they were not um, they were useful for just really for the staff and 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 folks who need them. Uh, we're also working to procure some additional masks for kids as well as for families to be able to offer uh, even at the schools those medical grade masks for distribution at the schools. We've also set up a number of testing sites uh, at CMS schools, and so we have six sites that operate throughout the week to make testing re easily accessible uh, to those schools. We have not been able to, at this time, secure enough rapid test kits to be able to provide them to, for example, all the, the, the staff or teachers at any organization, not just CMS, not even county employees or other places, uh, but we are, we're fortunate that the federal program is in place 
uh, now that individuals can request those on their own, but we, we have been making rapid testing available to to the school district uh, and to schools as needed uh, when situations arise. Uh, lastly, I'll say, you know, the um, the uh, we have about 150 school based coordinators that we have uh, hired on the course of the last 3 months to be able to help support CMS schools uh, as they are dealing with COVID related issues. So both contact tracing, testing coordination, the testing program uh, that the you know, that the schools have for for unvaccinated staff and teachers. Uh, and so those folks are on site again, 150 folks that we've trained through public health to be able to help provide supports, uh, not just to staff and, and, and frontline staff, but also to families and, and students as they're experiencing and dealing with issues related to COVID. Uh, so we are providing support as much as possible and, and obviously I'll always looking for opportunities to do more of that. Uh, I believe personally and professionally that, that kids learn better when they're in classrooms. I think we've heard today about the the mental health impacts that this pandemic has taken not just on us as adults but also kids uh, and one of those challenges is driven by the fact kids were learning remotely and not able to have those social interactions that are needed uh, for those individuals to be able to to truly those kids to be able to truly develop uh, not just academically but socially and emotionally uh, and so we we as a community have to prioritize kids being in school as an important thing. And if 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 we can have seventy five thousand people in the football field uh, to watch a game, I think we have to figure out ways to use the tools we have at our disposal to keep kids in classrooms so that they can learn academically. Because uh, we also know the impacts it's had on academic performance, uh, but also so that they can have that social emotional contact. And I recognize that um, you know I come to work every day. The folks at our hospitals are going to work, um, and we can do that because we're using the tools we have available. We're vaccinated. We're wearing masks. Uh, we're following those COVID protocols, and that really is our priority right now as we think about how to ensure. Uh, that kids are getting what they need uh, comprehensively uh, and that families are, are are well supported. So I hope that helps to answer your question a little bit. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Any, any of the panelists want to piggyback on that? On what Dr. Washington Did said. you want to piggyback on that? Yeah, I just really want to emphasize what uh, Dr. Washington said about uh, kids, children, excuse me, uh, learning better in an in-person environment, and that we're we're really going to have to continue to, uh, for the benefit of our children, and therefore the benefit of the future of our community, to um, to really um, um, understand what we need to do as a community to get our children back in school safely, uh, and that's all hands on deck. And and so I just wanted to um, underscore what Dr. Washington said. Uh, Regarding our children in schools. And so, Dr. Williams, I want to stay with you just for just a second, please, because you referenced something earlier that I think is really important, and I'd like for you to dig a little deeper on it. You talked about the social determinants of health and how they really impact what we see with respect to COVID. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and um, just dive a little bit deeper? Because I, I do think that that's important, particularly when you, you, we have a county of 1.1 million people, which mm -hmm. I think people really um, uh, don't really appreciate. And so when you when you look at that number and then you look at the, the numbers that have been impacted and then all the additional factors that go into um, how this, not only the variant, but just COVID in, in and of itself has impacted the community. I'd like for you to just dig a little deeper, please. Yeah, so uh, once again, um, Dr. Man Mankid uh, gave a statistic, 20%, 20% of, of chronic medical problems are attributed to genetics or biology. 80%, 80% is due to the environment and the behaviors we're engaged in, and we call those uh, factors, social determinants of health, where we live. Uh, upward mobility or lack thereof, food uh, lack of uh, of food or food insecurities, transportation insecurities, housing insecurities, uh, lack of access to health care. And so when you begin to look at those social determinants of health and you say to a population, um, well, um, go down to your local health care uh, center and get um, a COVID test, well, there are no healthcare centers in my particular area, neighborhood, or even within two or three bus um, 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 rides of a, of, a, of a center. Okay, so that 
is a challenge right there. Uh, we have individuals who may not have uh, the ability to quarantine early on in the pandemic. We talked about folks being at home and quarantining. All right. Uh, you have certain families where you have multiple generations within, you know, one bedroom apartments and things of that nature. Uh, not everyone um, has the opportunity to social distance in a, in a house with multiple rooms. So th those are some of the challenges that are not per se clinical, but socially driven that impacts have a profound impact on, on, on one's health. Um, upward mobility. Uh, we're talking about our children in education. Uh, lack of education or um, truncated uh, education, uh, we all know uh, has an impact on upward mobility. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we won't see uh, 10, 15, 12, you know, 15 years from now, uh, you know, significant challenges from uh, the cohort of students that are, are currently um, in, in, in school and, and experiencing uh, these challenges. So um, in, in short, Commissioner, uh, we cannot isolate uh, some of the many of the so social challenges across our communities uh, from this discussion of of health. Um, we cannot improve, will not improve the health of, of our communities unless those factors um, are addressed. Some of those factors are, are addressed by healthcare systems. Uh, some of those factors are addressed by um, uh, other uh, partner agencies, health and human service agencies. Um, I do feel that healthcare systems, uh, we are anchor institutions in our communities. Uh, we are public trust. Uh, while uh, we don't have all the solutions to these uh, challenges, uh, we should uh, be providing uh, uh, adaptive leadership and partnership to address these issues, and we're doing so. Appreciate that, uh, Dr. Dr. Williams, uh, I'll also, and uh, I saw in the chat, Nikki, uh, before we go to you, I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Uh, Delahari, you, you made a comment in the chat. Do you mind just sharing with the group? Oh, I actually, I had a different question. If you want to go to Nikita first, it's fine. I can wait. Okay. And then uh, just real quick, before I go to Nikita, I forget who asked the question about CMS, but uh, it, it, there's a comment in the chat saying, in addition to donated masks from Atrium, CMS has ordered more N95 masks from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services directly. Thanks, Atrium. Uh, Nikki? Hey, um, thank you, Kay, and thank you uh, all. Uh, thank you, everyone, all the great panelists, some great information shared here. Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm Nikita Mitchell, and I represent YPs at International House. My question is regarding the grant process, the grant which uh, Mac County provides to various ground root organizations to raise awareness about the web vaccine and around uh, COVID awareness. So uh, I have been part of several grant uh, cycles and I feel the application and the process is very, is not very user friendly. The process, the steps and the, the rules and the guidelines are not very clear and it has too many steps. So, like for a grassroots organization who doesn't have very um, set up account account system, or who if you have been a nonprofit for just an year, it's very hard to gather all those uh, accounting information and the um, and the um, paperwork required to fill up that grant. So. Is county doing anything to simplify that process? Sure, uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, um, I, I if you know there are a lot of um, uh, with government as as it as it is, um, there are a lot of accountability measures that are implemented to ensure uh, that the work that we do is transparent and and accountable for uh, the various people that we're accountable to, whether that be the state or federal government who may provide funding or to our local, you know, taxpayers here who uh, obviously uh, pay taxes to support government operations. And so we do have a number of policies and requirements that are um, 
that are really that are requirements. They're the procurement processes that we, the health department, don't uh, ourselves independently institute. Uh, we try to make our pieces of the equation as easy as possible, as uh, accessible as possible. Uh, we continue to work to make sure, and you know, Commissioner Rowe has been a huge champion of this in government for making sure that we lower the threshold for the administrative burden on grassroots organizations to be able to access resources and funding uh, that's are available to help partner with us on various initiatives. Uh, we have made some significant strides that the grants that you're talking about are actually um, a little bit better than usual uh, agreements, but we there's certainly, uh, it's true that there's more opportunity to make it more accessible for larger number of groups who are either uh, newly formed groups or groups that don't have a lot of infrastructure. Uh, and, and that really is a priority for us as we are, are um, recognize, as we recognize and have always recognized uh, the importance of, of working alongside our community organizations, um, particularly in the health department. I mean, we do a lot of work with churches and faith-based organizations, grassroots groups, immigrant groups, um, and all kinds of other uh, groups that represent uh, uh, really critical parts of our community. Uh, and so we continue to look for ways to streamline those processes. And I, I take that feedback as, as honest and, and something that we got to keep working at to make it easier. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And um, just uh, since I, we represent YPs at International House, and we would like to partner with the county on any initiatives and like we would love the opportunity to help the county in some way. So keep us in mind. And yes, yeah, thank you. So, certainly. Thank you. thank you for your 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 question. I, I do want to just um, take a moment of uh, just a pause real quick, just to just say thank you to everybody who's like, we have so many people in this community that are gr working at the grassroots level, boots on the ground, providing um, assistance. They have done it nonstop um, and, and, you know, just have a heart to serve. Um, you know, I can tell you, uh, Tiffany uh, sent a note and said that um, in Greer Heights, they're experiencing a transportation challenge with testing and vaccines for neighbors in Greer Heights. Um, she's saying her center director spent three days taking high school students to various sites to get tested. Her mom could not leave work and lose income to take her. And for a variety of reasons, she couldn't get tested at her school. So they're currently planning uh, testing and vaccination events to take place within the community um, and, and, and working with the county. And so, you know, shout out to Dr. Washington um, to arrange those uh, testing and, and vaccination events there for uh, the residents of uh, the Greer Heights community. But I, I just say that to highlight and, and to piggyback off of what Nikita said with respect to a lot of organizations are out working and have been working and and i think we'd be remiss if we did not acknowledge all of those um in particular with our refugee communities and, and immigrant communities and uh, and most vulnerable and so i'm just grateful for that and i know school board member delahara had a uh, question as well thank you commissioner Jarrell. um i just wanted to follow back up on the comments i really appreciated what um dr williams was talking about with the um the health uh, outcome or health determinants the social determinants um and i i uh, since i am a cms school board member at large i do want to just acknowledge that i agree with you that um that students learn best in schools um i'm also really grateful that dr washington and others have really um, stress the importance of the vaccine and just want to sort of remind us also that that is what's different this year is that we do have access to the vaccine and that's not what we had last year. And I say that because I think it's really important that we always remember that last year um, we had uh, a disproportionate amount of of students of color, families of color who were choosing the full remote academy presumably because they were keenly aware of their disparate out healthcare outcomes. And I just think that's really important. For example, we have our black population is 36%, yet 45% of the students who were choosing to stay home and be remote for all the reasons that you mentioned, Dr. Williams, um, including um, that they were three times more likely to have severe hospitalization, 
or possibly to die or to bring it home to grandma or whatever their life situation was. And I just want us to take a moment to acknowledge that um, because sometimes I fear that if in our community, when we um, somehow neglect to acknowledge it, not that I think anyone did that on purpose, that we send a message that somehow these families made the wrong choice by choosing to stay home. And of course, we're not saying that. And I know you're not saying that because they knew their healthcare disparities and determinants and they had to make the best choice for themselves. And so I just wanted to sort of level set on that. And certainly you can chime in and tell me if you agree or not, but I just want to, you know, it was a very different world last year. And I just want to be respectful of the tough choices that many families had to make. Sorry, was it uh, Dr. Williams? Did you have anything to uh, add? No, uh, I completely agree. Completely agree. <laughs> and and no, that's the, the, the call out on that. Mm -hmm. No, no, appreciate that. And then up next, I uh, see a hand, Miss Brown. I see a hand raised. Feel free to unmute. Uh, Judas Brown. And we can just move on. I'll send her a message directly, Commissioner Jarrell. Sounds good. Judy, did you have a question? Or a comment? Okay, she's gonna put her uh question in the chat. I just I just saw her note. Um and while she's doing it, we just have a few more minutes left. Um, I, I want to thank uh, everyone for for definitely joining us tonight and and for going through this. And um, this won't be the last update, obviously, as we continue to navigate this. Um, but while Judy's putting her questions and question in the chat, um, I, like I said, I wanted to just say thank you. I would like to give the opportunity uh, to Chairman Dunlap to share some comments if if he sees fit since he has joined us. So, uh, Chairman Dunlap, if you'd like to uh, uh, share any words, uh, we'd uh, love to hear from you. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, let me just start by saying thank you uh, for the information to the community. I think it's something that is... I also want to thank our partners um, for care. I want to thank all the panelists uh, I found the uh, session to be very informative. Uh, I learned I didn't know, and I'm always trying to be comfortable as uh, I can about the Omicron variant and uh, about COVID itself. Um, the one thing that, that I always question when we do these things is that the people who really need to be informed are never here listening. Earlier today, I was on. Um, on Twitter, and I read some of the comments that people were making, and I thought, well, maybe some of these people would at least try to come and get informed. But uh, you know, I was not surprised that I didn't see any of them among the names that I scrolled through. And so we've got to, uh, I, I, you know, there are some I'm sure that we will never be able to reach, but we've got to do a better job of educating the community so that the naysayers don't have more influence than those who have the knowledge and know-how about what's going on with this uh, pandemic. So again, thank all of you for uh, your participation and thank you, Mark, for allowing me this opportunity to speak. No, thank you, Chair Dunlap. Uh, always appreciate your support and uh, your leadership as, uh, as we've had to navigate through this pandemic. Um, Judy did ha put her questions uh, in the chat. This is how we'll do this. Uh, Judy's questions will be the last questions. Uh, she has one for Dr. Williams and, and for Dr. Monkhead. And then what we'll do is allow the panelists to give their final thoughts. But her first question to Dr. Williams, I'm going to read both questions, allow you guys to respond, and then we'll do go through final thoughts. Um, how does... How do the CBOs partner with Novant to bring testing to different neighborhoods like Greer Heights? So that'll be to you, Dr. Williams, and to Dr. Moncad. Uh, can you speak to the effort to make sure our young adults with intellectual disabilities receive the latest vaccine information and access to vaccines? 
I'll, I'll go first. So, uh, uh, typically, um, partnerships are developed in, in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we will reach out to uh, known CBOs within uh, across the community uh, to um, uh, partner with them to gain access to certain populations. And then the other way is uh, often CBOs will reach out uh, to us. And so um, if you uh, reach out, uh, we have a community engagement um, 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 website, uh, Novant Health Community Engagement website, where we have a link where you can just reach out and say, hey, I am a part of a community organization. I'm trying to seek information. Uh, and one of our team members will, will connect and evaluate how we can uh, assist in, 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 in bringing testing or vaccines or uh, other services uh, that uh, we may be able to partner on. Great. Uh, I think it's my turn I, and I'll, I'll be very brief uh, with the uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That is a population that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, these are um, members of our community who have been overlooked for decades, for centuries, um, and uh, deserve to be treated uh, with dignity. Um, and respect uh, as uh, full human beings. And so I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to mention uh, efforts uh, to reach this population. If the individual um, has severe intellectual disabilities, they may be receiving um, enhanced services through something called the innovations waiver. Um, if they are a waiver participant, um, and there are several hundred of those in Mecklenburg County, then they have an Alliance care manager. This is someone who is uh, working for them and has a fairly small caseload and their job, their entire job is to connect people uh, to care. Uh, and so uh, my recommendation is that if we're talking about a person on the innovations waiver, please reach out to your care manager at Alliance and um, see what we can do to, to help connect uh, the individual to vaccine resources. As I'd mentioned at the beginning, we are new to Mecklenburg County, we've been here in the county for just a few weeks. And one thing that we're excited to do is form, and I hope I'm not gonna ruffle any feathers, form the relationships in Mecklenburg that we have in Wake County. See, I went there. I, I don't know, you know, y'all have to give me a pass. Um, but uh, uh, I, I can't wait to keep working with Dr. Washington um, and uh, the resources that Mecklenburg has uh, so that we can learn um, how to to get that vaccine access uh, for our members uh, with IDD. Thank you. I think that was the last question, Commissioner. Yes, that's it. We'll go to closing remark. So we'll go to closing remarks right now. I will start. Um, we'll start with um, Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. Moncad, and then uh, we'll allow um, Dr. Washington um, to uh, to close it out. Uh, once again, I just want to say thanks, Commissioner Jarrell, for pulling us all together for this important conversation. I, I would uh, like to respond to Commissioner Dunlap. Um, um, how do we connect with those individuals that? are not on uh, this webinar. And, and that's where developing uh, um, trusted partnerships with others across the community so that we can leverage those voices, those resistant voices, okay? Those resistant voices, they also have leaders in their communities. And so if we can identify and connect with those uh, particular leaders, uh, hopefully we can uh, leverage their voice in, in delivering these important messages. Now, I will also say that um, uh, we have to um, be persistent. We cannot give up because as soon as we let our guard down, misinformation will take over. Uh, so I, I thank once again, uh, Commissioner Jarrell for pulling a group of folks together from different organizations, however, with the same message and that's, and that's, that's key. Thank you. Uh, 
For for my closing remark, I'm going to actually open a little bit of a Pandora's box and uh, mention a topic that we didn't uh, have a little, we didn't have time for, or we didn't talk about. Uh, but uh, I don't want it to be swept under the rug. I had mentioned in my slides that overdose uh, rates in North Carolina and in Mecklenburg are higher than they have ever been in the history of us ever, ever measuring this number. Um, when people are alone uh, and they are nervous and they don't know what to do, uh, we are noticing that they are reaching for the bottle uh, or they are reaching for pills or doing other things that harm themselves. I just need people to understand that we get it. Um, it is a tough time. And if that is the way that you are trying to get by and you are ready to try something else, please reach out. Wonderful. Well, uh, let me just also express my thanks to everyone for being here tonight, particularly the community members who are here asking questions. And uh, I just ask that folks uh, take information, whatever you may have gleaned from this discussion, and share that with somebody else uh, and make it available to those that are around you. Uh, and finally, as you know, <clears throat> as been said, we've been in this pandemic for two years now, uh, going into year three. And I know this is incredibly difficult for a lot of people, including myself and everybody else that's here today. I'm sure we've had uh, some 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 really dark days. And so I, I think I just encourage people to remember that we're all experiencing that and to, to love each other and to be kind uh, and to check on people. Uh, ask, and I think it was already said, ask people how they're doing and wait for an answer. Uh, we're doing more of that around here and making sure we're taking care of ourselves. So uh, with that, thank you all so much for being here tonight and Commissioner Durrell, good night. Yeah, thank you everybody. I, I'll tell you that sometimes a simple thing, uh, be nice, love one another. That's a great way to end this. Thank you to all of our panelists and everybody who attended tonight. Jay Tembo, thank you for uh, really quarterbacking this thing and, and putting it together. Dan Scudder, who is our IT expert, for the county, he and his team, just so appreciative for what you do and all of our community leaders. Thank you again for a great conversation. Uh, it won't end here. And uh, good night to everyone. Good night.